Welcome to This Week in Heresy, episode 78, The Magic of Pagan Music, with our guest via Skype, Sharon Knight. Hey Sharon, welcome to This Week in Heresy. Thank you. Hello, Gina. (laughs) Hey, so for the sake of our audience, I know most of the pagan audience will know who you are, but for the rest of my audience, can you um, talk a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, I'm Sharon Knight, and I am a musician. (laughs) Um, I play a vaguely Celtic style. um, Seems like each year it gets a little bit less Celtic. (laughs) Um, But it's definitely inspired by my Celtic roots. And um, it's got a lot of myth and magic woven into it. Um, So it's, you know, Celtic-inspired folk rock that we call neo-folk romantique. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I've been a fan for a while. I'll be I'll, I'll just put that right out there um, right away. Um, in fact, actually, uh, which one was it? It was the second Pandemonium album, which the one with oh, the Dangerous awesome, Beauty, probably. That, yeah, because I love the song Dangerous Beauty because like, right. I was going through a bad roommate situation at the time. <laughs> and it was somebody that I was kind of attracted to anyway that I was living with. And she... And it turned ugly and bad. And so, like, that song just kind of, like, summed up the whole situation for me. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, I guess we'll start at the beginning. And, like, how did you get into doing music and specifically pagan music? Well, let's see. Um, I realized around sixth grade that... I liked singing and that I was somewhat good at it and um, people would stop bullying me and um, be nice to me if I sang. (laughs) So that certainly was, you know, an impetus. It made me feel like, um, you know, hey, I I might actually be sort of good at this. And, but I didn't do a lot with it until I was about – 18 or so, and that's about the time that I discovered paganism. So both things really came to life for me at the same time. And uh, I find music just in and of itself very magical. So the things really go together. You know, both practices are very artistic and about being in the flow of creative relationship with the world around us. So they really, they really go together. Um, so how did you get into more of the Celtic music? Is it just, does it stem from your learning paganism or is it just some like Celtic stuff? Has, has that always been something you've been interested in? Actually that happened. Boy, those two things really happened right around the same time. <laughs> you know, I was listening to the popular music of, of the day, you know, music from the 70s and 80s. <laughs> um, and I particularly loved music that already had sort of a Celtic spin. Like I loved Jethro Tull and mm-hmm. Hart and Led Zeppelin, especially the the more, you know, when Jimmy Page would play the mandolin so I already had a predilection toward Celtic music. And then um, about I, I went to the Ancient Ways Festival because my cousin discovered a, around Halloween, of course, a witch on the radio. Oh. And uh, yeah, and, and she knew I was fascinated by that. So she told me about him and he told me about the Ancient Ways Festival up at Harbin Hot Springs. So... And right around this time, I can't even remember how I got turned on to it. I think I was working in a health food store and I made friends with another musician there who was playing Celtic music. And he turned me on to artists like Planksty and Steel Eye Span and Fairport Convention. And so right around, oh, and then I discovered the fairy tradition right around Mm. this time too. And um, my particular teacher in the fairy tradition brought a lot of the Celtic myths and legends in. So we worked with a lot of Celtic deities and it just all sort of hit at the same time. And I don't know if it was an ancestral feeling in me or whatnot, but the music, I just feel so have always felt so drawn to the British Isles and Ireland in particular. And, um, and the music too is just got this haunting otherworldly quality to it. Mm Mm-hmm. 
So, you know, I, I can't even remember. They both kind of fed each other at the same time. Um, and I know you do a good deal of work with your partner, Winter. And how did you guys get together? And how did that start? How did you guys start doing music together? We met at this very same Ancient Ways Festival. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So I went to that thing pre- pretty much, I think, almost everyone they had. And I mm-hmm. met Winter probably, it was my fifth or sixth one when he showed up. Mm-hmm. It was love at first sight. Aww. <laughs> Actually, there's one of the songs, and I think it is on Dangerous Beauty, that I just love. Um, uh, what's the one? Is, is it the Shiva? What, Shiva? On oh. Dangerous Beauty, huh? Is it Dangerous Beauty or is it the one before? Is it the other one? I don't think we have one about Shiva. Oh, maybe I'm I'm thinking of the wrong day, <laughs> but it's a beautiful song. It, it's just a beautiful love song. And oh, um, you're probably thinking of Lord Fenugreek. From yeah, pos- yes, yeah. yes, that's the one. <laughs> that's just so beautiful, and I'm just like, oh, it's so cute. <laughs> that, that just re- you talking about that reminded me of that too. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe I should clarify for your listeners that. Um, uh, we also have another project, which is called Pandemonium, right. which, uh, which is what created the Dangerous Beauty album. So, right. um, you know, Winter backs me up on my solo stuff, which is more of the acoustic, acoustic Celtic flavor. Mm-hmm. And then Pandemonium is more like a full on rock branching into metal. Even it's like a folk metal band. Yeah. Just for clarity. Yeah. They all kind of meld together because I have them all on digital. So it's just kind yeah. of like on the same playlist. So. And, then, you know, it's definitely winter and I have a specific sound, whether mm-hmm. we're rocking out more or being acoustic. So mm-hmm. that makes sense. Um, just to kind of like talking about spiritual music in general, you know, there's really good spiritual music <laughs> and there's some really bad spiritual music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How do you feel about that kind of like, it just seems like there's kind of like one or the other and there's not much in between. Well, you know, I, I think the thing about music for spirituality is, um, you know, it, it's so everybody can do it. You know, everybody yeah. can enjoy making music and, um, they don't necessarily have to commit to being a professional musician and all of the discipline that that entails. They can just do it mm-hmm. for the joy of making music. And there's definitely nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I guess, I guess that's the mostly what I have to think of it. It's kind of like, kind of like folk music, you know, it's music for the people. It's for music mm-hmm. for people to just enjoy doing. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I, I think so too. And, you know, some of the, there's some stuff that I listen to that, you know, some people I know, they're like, why are you listening to that? And then <laughs> I'm like, cause it moves me and it makes me happy and it make, fills me with spirit and I really like it. That's the reason to listen to music. <laughs> right. Do you have, like, do you like to do special workings with music for your deities and do, does some of that stuff? Like if you do a working with something and something comes out of that, do does sometimes that end up on one of your albums? Oh, absolutely. Quite often. <laughs> <laughs> Figures. <laughs> yep. Yeah, like um Fierce Black Soul of Night is devoted oh, to Kali in specific. Mm-hmm. And then uh Eater of Sorrow is I'm not even exactly sure who that being is deity wise, but definitely like Skathak keeps coming to mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, definitely she's a, a nightmare goddess of the sea that rises up out of the sea of consciousness and flushes our fears to the surface by bringing nightmare. Mm-hmm. So it's like the healing power of nightmare. So yeah, it definitely feels like most of our songs come out of some sort of communion with magic or gods or spirits. And also it sounds like you do some retooling or covers of some older Celtic songs as well, right? Oh yeah. That's definitely how I started out as a musician is learning and performing traditional Celtic songs. And then, you know, the, the longer we, stick with music the more we've branched out and written some of our own songs and then you know 
we've written at this point quite a lot of songs and, you know, really stepped out of the traditional Celtic motif. Not that I don't still love it, but just, I don't know, I just want to grow and do new things and different things. Mm -hmm. And you've also done a couple of albums of Chance with Thorne. Cool. Yes. <laughs> which I absolutely adore, especially the ones for the dark time of the year. Yeah. Um, how did that, how did you guys end up doing that? How did you guys, end up, how'd that come about? Well, gosh, um, we met briefly many, many years ago when we were both uh, just studying fairy. And then we went out of each other's lives for a long time. And then trying to remember how we came back into each other's lives I don't even remember but she ended up living about five minutes from where <laughs> where we live awesome yeah oh and then she ended up producing a lot of her stuff through our studio like her elemental castings podcast was all produced through El, Main, El Mundo Bueno Studios which is our recording studio and she did a, a series of teaching videos that were produced through our studio. So, so she really got connected. Um, you know, we reconnected through projects that she was already doing. And, um, you know, she had some chance anyway. I, I, it just seemed like an obvious thing to do. And so mm -hmm. we did it. <laughs> awesome. I'll tell you, my very favorite chant is the one for Hikate. Oh, and yeah. I know there's a story behind that. Could Would you be willing to talk about that? Yeah, it's definitely one of the most powerful stories of my life. Absolutely. So sure. Um, uh, I had a coven sister named Tara Webster. Um, mm -hmm. she sh We shared the same birthday and everything. And uh, we were in a coven called the Crescent Hellions. And um, we were just sure that we were going to grow old together. But we did not grow old together. Tara got a got brain cancer mm. and within uh, two months of being diagnosed she she died mm. so while this was happening we were thorn and i were recording songs for the waning year and um you know we had a lot to get done oh deadline before Sawin and all that um so and and then uh, the people who were tending Tara at the time said, you know, if you want to see Tara again, you'd, you'd better come soon. And so I was thinking, oh, you know, maybe maybe I should wait till tomorrow. I've got so much to do today. And then I just thought, no, it's really got to be today. So I went and several people were there. Thorne was there. You know, her husband was there, of course. Um, a handful of other really close friends were there. There were probably eight people there. And, um, you know, I was thinking that I was just going to, I'm just, you know, there to see her one of the few last times, but it turned out she died that, that night that we were all there. Wow. So it was the first time I had ever witnessed, um, somebody's passing like mm -hmm. right at the moment. And it was surprisingly powerful and beautiful and has actually, um, since then I've got sort of a conviction that's grown within me of being with people and singing for them when they are when it's their time to die but anyway I'm, I'm digressing from the story you asked for a little bit oh that's um, okay so yeah so while we were there um her breathing started to shift and and you know there was a person there who was familiar with death and was really facilitating the process who said you know look this this is happening right now you better come in and so we all came in and we're with her and um thor needed to step out into the hall for a minute because right at that moment this hikate chant just poured into her while tara was dying tara was a, a priestess of hikate so that was super powerful and we had a studio session booked that night too um so we and we still kept that that commitment. We we went into the studio and Thorne recorded that song that night, you know, a couple hours after Tara had died. Wow. And then um while we were in there, we also recorded um Cross the River, which is also on that That's CD. That's their favorite one. Oh, it just uh it's broke beautiful. my heart. Like even when I listen to that song now, I just I can hear the the emotion that was with us that night, it just still makes me cry every time. 
<laughs> so yeah, it was pretty amazing to that you know that that Hakate chant would just drop into Thorn right at that moment. Mm-hmm. These are the things that remind me that magic is real. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it, it sounds a, a, a lot like the experiences I've had of watching. I've watched a couple people pass. Um, my great aunt, and then I used to do volunteer work with people who were passing at the hospital, and I did witness one before I stopped doing it. And um, yeah, it's amazing just what comes to you in those moments, and how just how powerful it is at that very moment when somebody crosses. Yeah, and just I know, like the first time I, I described it, where you know I saw because I'm I'm a priest of Hikate too, so. You know, I saw Hikate the first time with my great aunt. I saw her sit there and show my aunt her face. Wow. And then she went into with the with the ancestors and I was just like ba 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 You know, I couldn't speak for a while. But what was really interesting is that everybody, regardless of what tradition they were in, all felt a similar sense of release. And it's and, and like it was just really powerful. But like everybody ended up going home after that and doing something creative, writing something down, sh- you know, and sharing things and emails with the family, uh, in like and stuff that ended up in her memorial service too. So it was so I totally understand. <laughs> yeah, powerful. You recent um, I know recently you started doing a big festival. I guess it's right. Hexen Fest. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And um, it's, it's good. To, <laughs> that goes with pandemonium. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, Hexen Fest. We, we created Hexen Fest largely because we don't do a lot of gigs with pandemonium because mm-hmm. there's six and sometimes seven of us as the full band. So it's really hard to take that, that act on the road. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we figured, well, we'll bring people to us. Hey. And so, you know, it gives us a chance to uh, have some of our touring musician friends come out to to our neck of the woods and come to our party. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's that's a good time. Excellent. So you just like so is that that most of the thing or is it more of like, hey, we need a we need to have a pagan festival in our area or a a music festival? Well, that too, you know, and specifically a pagan music festival. Because, you know, Winter and I tour all over the country and we go to all kinds of these cool music festivals, you know, pagan music festivals and mythic music festivals, fairy music festivals. And we don't really have much of that at all in California. And we were like, come on, man, California, especially the San Francisco area, we're supposed to be the music mecca. We are losing our edge here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. So that was part of it is, you know, God, why don't we have something like this here? Why do we have to drive all the way to the East Coast to go to these things? Yeah. Or at least to Oregon. You know, we could drive up to Fairy Worlds a lot. Mm-hmm. We just thought, you know, there's definitely room for something like this in California. So so it's at Isis Oasis. It's a three-day camping festival. And Saturday is the music day. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you want to come just for the Saturday, they can do that. And, Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And is it accessible in uh, at least the concert area? Is that accessible uh, to some degree? Like wheelchair accessibility, uh-huh. mean? Yeah, actually, there's a ramp in the in the back of the theater. So, so yes. Awesome. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah. So, you know, you, we we talked a bit about like how your paganism informs your music, obviously, and it's kind of part and parcel <laughs> with it. Um, but how does it? Um, in your regular practice, your personal practice, how does music play in that? So, uh, so yeah, I would definitely say that music is very central to my day-to-day practice of magic. Um, I, song is what connects me to the deeper realms, and also song is largely what I offer my gods and the spirits that I communicate with. So, you know, I really see magic as this underlying current of aliveness that permeates everything in our world, and it's always there. But we can easily forget 
how to see it because we're so busy fulfilling the roles that our society expects of us, you know, like we're Mm -hmm. expected to behave a certain way and um, we're expected to be either a man or a woman, for example, although that's challenged a lot lately we're you know we're expected to behave a certain way or just you know whatever it is we're expected to participate in society according to these you know structures and magic is much more fluid and flowing than that you know there's just this undercurrent that pulses through everything and so creating music and singing especially for me really helps me to drop below Oh, all of these mental constructs and just dip into the flow of magic. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it really is my core magical practice. You know, I may offer the gods some wine and some, <laughs> some snacks and say prayers and light incense and light candles. But for the most part, it's music is the meat and that other stuff is just setting the temple. Mm-hmm. How would you encourage people who would like to begin doing their own music and especially in the pagan music world like if somebody's really really wants to um play for others and you know do playing for rituals and things like that how would you suggest for them to start well let's see practice 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 (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know i guess um, there, there aren't really, let's just practice, um, probably the, the best advice is the, you know, time honored one as which is start by learning songs that you really like, because that's going to keep it fun for you. And, uh, you know, having a teacher that can break it down for you and show you easy ways to play something and can, if, if a song is have them teach you a simplified version until you can build up to the harder parts. But, but yeah, you know, choose songs that you love and, and find a teacher who inspires you, you know, kind of like the way we learn magic. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I, I did some music when I was younger. I don't do it as much anymore. Most of the music that I do is actually similar, you know, where I do it for deity or, you know, in circle or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. Cause, um, I wanted to play acoustic guitar and I found a really awesome teacher. He was, he's an old grizzly, old <laughs> grizzly guy that taught me some really old, like folk songs and blues and, you know, and he really liked to help me. And, um, he liked to help me learn songs that from, uh, musicians that I really liked, you know, right on, you know, another tip that feels really important is don't give yourself a hard time. <laughs> Just let it be okay if you're not that good or as good as you want to be at first. Just enjoy the process. Don't criticize yourself. Talk to your like like you would talk to someone you love. <laughs> right. Well, I think that would go for both magic and music, you know? Yeah. Be yeah. kind to yourself if you think you've screwed up. Yep. I know I have a hard so time doing that itself. sometimes. It it is hard, and we humans are just so good at browbeating ourselves, and less good at being kind to ourselves. Mm-hmm. I would like to remind people that don't forget to cut yourself some slack. You're learning. You know, I know when when I perform or I do public speaking, um, especially if I'm talking about spiritual topics. Um, there's a kind of like an out of bodiness that I have. Like it's hard for me to remember what happened while I was performing. And then people are like, yeah, it was really awesome. And it was amazing. And I'm like, okay, I'll take your word for it. Do you kind of have that (laughs) out of body thing happen too? Oh yeah. I live for that experience. You know, the feeling where the, the spirit of the music just takes over you like like you're channeling something and it's just washing through you and you become bigger than than the sum of your parts. And and then it washes through you to the audience and they feel it too. And it's like you form this connection of just something much more vast than 
than your everyday self. It's it's the best. It's really it's like channeling the gods. Mm-hmm. I, I totally get that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you know, I actually get that too when like when I see artists that I really love perform. Like um, one of my favorite artists is Dead Can Dance. And just oh, yeah, I love them. Lisa Gerard performing. Oh my god, she is amazing. Oh, uh, yeah, and she's one of my all-time favorite singers. Oh, mine too. And just like watching her on stage, like you know, there's something else there within her. Oh yeah. And but you know, I I find that happening with a lot of the artists, no matter what genre, really. Like mm-hmm. there's something in their eyes. Like I remember watching uh, going to REM. A long time back, and um, and Michael Stipe had put had kind of made this like crow like mask of makeup during for for the performance, yeah. and just like the way he was performing, he was just like I'm like, that's not quite you, is it? <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, I think that's a pretty central thing for for all musicians is you know wanting to capture that spirit and you know who knows what lisa gerard is channel but man it's vast and ancient and powerful for sure oh absolutely well i remember there's a quote i don't remember who it was i think i read it on in, on a, in a liner notes somewhere maybe it was santana's liner notes and he was quoting somebody else where it's like like music is uh, like rock and roll musicians or shamans yeah, I I believe that. It's definitely got a lot of truth to it. Mm-hmm. Cuz you know, you're you're reaching into that that sea of consciousness, that that current of magic to try to try to capture something. This one musician friend of mine that we've worked with a lot, uh Gary Haggerty, he he was talking with us about that one day that you know, he just really tries you know it's the impetus for practice for him is that he just really tries to play in just the right way that that the spirit is conjured and you can feel it you know when you're in the pocket or on the groove or whatnot like you'll just be there and that magical thing will happen that this kind of spine tingling feeling will come over you and i think that's really the the core goal for, for all musicians, even if they don't think of themselves as magical musicians. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's one of the many ways we can be closer to deity. Yeah. And, and closer to the earth because there's, you know, the rhythms, of, especially of the drums, you know, for me, like drumming is like the thing, like those rhythms just really seem to resonate with the earth beneath my feet. Oh yeah. I, that makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. I quite love drumming. I don't do it as much as I'd like to. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> but yeah, it's the pulse of the earth, really. And you know, you get on that groove and you get in that trance space. And before you know it, you're you're journeying far beyond the limits of our rational minds. Well, I, I know some of the most powerful visions I've had are when I've been drumming with the group or with other people. In fact, I remember the first time I had gone on a magical vacation, sort of. Ooh. Um, I went to Zuni Mountain Sanctuary in New Mexico, which is amazing. And um, we just had a, like, we just decided that we were going to have a drum session one night because we could. <laughs> um, right on. And it was actually because um, Crow is my spirit animal. And yeah. My guide to the spirit world. And that was the first time I met Crow. And like, I'm sitting there drumming and drumming and we're chanting. And suddenly I'm standing in the desert and Crow's sitting there like, so you ready? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and Crow just flies right into my head. Wow. And he's been there ever since. So. Wow, nice. One of those moments where, yep, magic mm-hmm. is real. <laughs> Absolutely. What are some of your favorite moments of from being a musician? Like, what what are some of the favorite stories to talk about? Oh boy, 
that might take a minute. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a Capricorn. So right out of the gate, I think of the, the goal oriented stories, like, you know, some of the epic people I've gotten to share stages with um you know, I totally like, get that I'm Capricorn too so <laughs> oh yes <laughs> so you know all about that mm-hmm. so you know um certainly it's been a thrill for me to share stages with um Mordruna and Corvus Corax and Fawn mm-hmm. you know because these are some of my musical heroes right um and some of the festivals that we've played at have been really fun where these people also were like fairy worlds is one of my favorite festivals mm-hmm. um so you know there's that kind of thing but that's that's more of the capricorn oriented thing <laughs> so <laughs> as far as maybe what would be more interesting to your listeners mm-hmm. <laughs> um well you know, collaborating in general, collaborative experiences with our fellow musicians, I just love. I love the spontaneity. And, um, you know, a lot of us are on the same touring circuits. Like, you know, we'll end up playing the same shows that S.J. Tucker plays or Heather Dale or Wendy Rule. Right. And, you know, oh, at this show, you know, this festival, this conglomeration of musicians that I love is going to be there. And it, and then we part ways and go to another festival and a different bunch of musicians that we love are going to be there. And we'll often sit in on each other, other sets. So, um, you know, this just makes each show and each performance have just a different blend of of people Mm -hmm. um so you know that's a big part of of the fun is the the spontaneity that crops up i I can't think of any specific stories right this minute probably one Mm -hmm. will come to me as soon as we hang up (laughs) right oh i should have told that one yeah (laughs) um where do you see pagan music in general going i mean is it i mean do you see like, is there a different future? Are people going in new directions? Well, I certainly hope that it will continue to grow. I remember when I recorded my very first album, Incantation, which was mm. sort of a my own sort of bardic pagan folk song experiment, and there just wasn't really much at all in the way of pagan music, and I was just a weirdo. Nice. <laughs> and... Uh, over the years, it has turned into really a thing with some very good musicians in it. Like S.J. Tucker is mm-hmm. a very good musician. Okay. Um, her band Tricky Pixie are all fantastic musicians. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dave the Bard is an outstanding musician. Right. Um, and I think there is a a movement that has grown up around paganism and pagan music you know at first it started out as very much a fringe culture where we just wanted to worship different gods or we had you know different experiences with these other beings that were not the christian god and we wanted to know who these beings were and so it started out as a religious movement but it's grown to be more of a a culture uh, an entire culture of which religion is just a part and i think these music festivals cropping up is part of that. You know, there's the Caldera Music Festival that's having its first year in uh, Lafayette, Georgia, for example. Oh, wow. And then there's, you know, these fairy festivals that have cropped up all over the place that are certainly pagan-friendly, if not outright pagan. They're still very much, you know, the myths and legends and folklore are coming into play with musical expression. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think it's growing. And uh, in Europe, it's even stronger than it is here. I mean, there's a whole genre of music called pagan folk in Europe. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Like Fawn and Omnia are both bands Mm -hmm. within that genre. And I think here in America, we're still, because it's still such a Christian country, I think we're a little nervous about coming right out and calling our music pagan folk. Like, you know, we call ours neo-folk romantique because right. uh, I just I just think we'd scare people off. Came right out and said, we're pagan folk, but we are. <laughs> we just have to, you know, disguise it a little bit so that we'll be allowed to play in the South. Right. 
<laughs> well, it's 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 kind of unfortunate that you have to do that because you know, you know, other re- um, religious groups have their own music, you know, and you know, there's some you know, there's some Christian bands that I actually like. There's yeah, a lot that I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, you know, there's even some um, Muslim uh, musicians. Like, there's a one of my professors when I was at seminary. Um, oh, what's his name? But anyway, he's he's from Morocco and he's really an amazing singer. And he has his album out. And you know, it's it's like, well, you know, paganism is growing. Paganism is getting more and more in the more mainstream part of the religious talk and the and, and stuff. So, you know, why not have our music come out into that realm as well? Yeah, indeed. Indeed. I think it will. You know, part of it for us is we don't necessarily want to, you know, be classified as a as a religious act. Mm-hmm. You know, we definitely want our music to to speak to people across religious definitions, but we certainly right. want for there to be an element of our music. Like I always want to be offering sacred chants as part of what we do. Right. Right. Are you thinking of doing a, another chant album or at some point? Maybe at some point right now I'm doing chants just as part of a subscription service mm-hmm. that we have through Patreon. And then, um, you know, if, if I get enough of those built up, I will, probably you know consider putting out another cd we just finished a a very ambitious recording project called Mm. portals which features um a lot of these guest musicians that i was just referring to you know that we do spontaneously sitting in on each other's sets kind of thing Mm -hmm. and that was so much work that we're kind of like you know i'm just gonna chill out on the planning CDs for a little while and just do music from a monthly subscription place. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just cause man, it's, it's all, it's a whole other thing. It's a fantastic (laughs) album though. I, I, I listened to, I, I got it. Yeah. I I backed, I backed your Kickstarter. Oh, thank you. I did, I did get the album eventually and some extra stuff that you guys put out and, it's it's a fantastic album. That's it's, it's Thank beautiful, you. and the video came out awesome too. Yeah, I'm happy about it. <laughs> Thank you. So you you guys should all everybody who's listening should go and check out Portals. It's a fantastic album. Woohoo! Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Well, you know, gotta plug gotta plug the music. It's all good. <laughs> right on. Um, do you guys ever get any flack for your music? Like, do do you get some negativity thrown your way sometimes? You know, not really. I'm trying to think if... I mean, I can't think of anything in a while. You know, I mean, certainly we don't, we, we don't get chosen. You know, there's always, there's always those feelings of, oh, they chose somebody else besides me that every musician has to deal with, you know. Right. But but no, people have been actually extremely supportive, by by and large. So you know we're probably not everybody's cup of tea, but they mm. don't feel the need to tell us about it. They just don't buy our music, I guess. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy um, about it. Yeah, especially since you know p- pretty people are pretty passionate when it comes to music. So yeah, <laughs> that that's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. Um. What do you think of um, moving from where, where the, at least in general of the music industry, moving from more of CDs and and that kind of album base to everything going online? Well, you know, that's a little scary in some ways. Um, the whole everything being you know downloadable, I love that because mm-hmm. you don't have to create a CD and, you know, have a plastic product in the world and you don't have to, you know, I mean, they're expensive to print those suckers. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, my wife made a CD a while back and just the cost just to make 20, it was just like, (sighs) yeah. Yeah. So, so offering it up as a download is nice because you just put your music up there and really, and we have our own studio, so we don't have 
a whole lot of expenses to outlay for just downloads. And then it's like, People can just buy them forever and you don't have to get them reprinted and whatnot. So so that part's great. And I've been really happy with that. Um, mm-hmm. The part that's scary to me is right. uh, more and more people are just streaming Pandora or Spotify. Right. And um, musicians make almost nothing, you know. Um, I mean, really, it's like 0.001% per mm-hmm. per play. So it's ridiculous. You can be all, woohoo, I got played, my song got played a million times on Spotify. And then you'll get a check for like $1,000 maybe. <laughs> and if you're not getting played a million times, I mean, it's ridiculous. Or you'll get a check for $400. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, and you know, we don't get played multiple millions of times. So Right. We, we, I mean, we just don't really make any money at all from Spotify. Um, I try to think of it as radio play, like, okay, well, this is the new radio, and at least I don't have to pay somebody to play me on the radio. However, when people, when that's the only way they listen to music mm-hmm. is just stream Spotify, then it's kind of like, hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that's a little scary, and that does seem to be more happening more and more. Um, however, people also do seem to really understand the culture of supporting musicians. And, you know, there's always been those different levels of people. Like, you know, some people even back in the olden days, they they just aren't music never, lovers enough. that So they would only listen to the radio. They wouldn't go out and buy records. Right. And so that's always been there. And, you know, then you have people who are much larger music fans who go to the live shows and who buy the CDs and want to get them signed. And so that culture is still alive and well enough that we're able to make a living doing this. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that'll continue to grow. I mean, there's things like Patreon have come into existence as one of the ways of, of solving this problem, for example, where you can, you can subscribe to an artist or support them and get, an ongoing stream of their work that way. So, you know, it does seem like even though in some ways the climate has gotten, you know, a little bit scary for musicians, there's also, you know, solutions that are cropping up at the same time. So. (laughs) Yeah. And I know, I know for me, like usually what I'll do is I'll preview albums on things like Spotify or Google play. Yeah. And then, and then if I really like the album, I'll go buy it. Yeah, and a lot of people do that. And, you know, a lot of artists are offering specialty things now, too. Like, oh, you, you can stream it on Spotify, but if you decide you really want it, then you can buy it and you can get, you know, a lyric book with it or whatever. Or you can yeah. get the CD. It's got all this artwork in it. You so, you know. Or, yeah. Yeah. So there's, like, different levels that people can participate if they love your music. And it seems to work out. Yeah, I, I, I um, Sarah, um, my wife, Sarah, uh, also known as Major Machines, she has a couple <laughs> albums out and she she was complaining one day that she only had like 50 cents from Spotify. And I'm like, honey, that makes you almost a millionaire on Spotify. Okay, kind so. of it's like, whoa, two, you, two numbers to the left of the decimal point. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope I hope that you know, the music industry will figure it out <laughs> and yeah. it'll get better. And hopefully, you know, I, I hope things will work out and then artists will get paid more and all that. I really, really, really hope that. I do too. It's so funny. It's like each generation seems to have their group of people that come up with some new way to rip off an artist. Yeah, <laughs> it just right. kind of boggles the mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't matter what kind of art either. Yeah, I know. It's true. It's really gotten very difficult to make any money with writing. And then mm-hmm. if you're, you know, a visual artist and you have it on the internet, people will just, you know, why should I buy the art? I'll just download it from the internet. Mm-hmm. Well, podcast <laughs> podcasting is the same way. You know, I have a Patreon too, but, you know, it's kind of slow going. Yeah. Patreon. And so if yeah. everybody, like, we both have Patreon, so you can go support both of us. Um, right. <laughs> um, 
but you know, even with podcasts, it's, 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 it's difficult because, you know, there's a lot of work behind it and a lot of people don't really understand that just how much work goes into putting out a song, putting out a podcast, making an album, you know, doing the interviews, doing the, you know, getting the musicians together, that kind of stuff. You know, it, it just seems like with movies and music and art, you know, people don't understand just how much goes into something they consume. Yeah, that very well could be. <laughs> well, like I know we, my, I, I know I've done some film stuff too with my wife, and you know it's it's a lot of work, and you don't really understand just how much it is until you actually do it. <laughs> yep, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, making a film is crazy amount of work. Oh yeah, man, that's right. Because with the video, that must have been. I mean. You, you got it was an amazing video, so I'm sure it was a ton of work, just the makeup and costumes alone. It was. Mm-hmm. It was fun though. God, I loved doing that so much. Mm-hmm. I really got the bug of wanting to turn all of our songs into these little mini stories. Yeah. Kind of like these little five minute, you know, cinematic narrative stories based on our songs. I'd love to do that over and over again. <laughs> That would be cool, but knowing yep. how much work it's, it would be, you'd have to yep. do another Kickstarter. <laughs> I know. Sure. Oh, my God. And then doing those, doing crowdfunding is a lot of work, too. Mm-hmm. Man, oh, man. I'm still fulfilling perks. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's all good, though. You Definitely. know, what, stuff that stuff that's worth doing is a lot of work. Absolutely. Well, on that note, um, we're just about out of time. So, um, if people would like to get in touch with you, find your music and all of that stuff, where, how would be the best way to go about that? Easiest way is my website, SharonKnight.net. Excellent. Yeah. And I'm also on Facebook and Twitter, you know, mm-hmm. Sharon Knight music on Facebook and Sharon Knight 777 on Twitter and Instagram. Mm-hmm. But even that info can be found just from good old SharonKnight.net. Yeah. And we'll have the link in the show notes as well. And also, if you want to get Sharon's newest music, um, there's SharonKnight.bandcamp.com slash album slash portals. That'll be in the show notes as well. And don't forget Patreon. Patreon. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> yep. I'm Sharon Knight on Patreon. <laughs> yep. And this week in Heresy, too, has a Patreon. So. Right on. Yep. <laughs> so promote each other. Woo-hoo. Yes, I will go check that out. I have this deal where for each $100 I make on Patreon, I support another another Patreon creator. So Excellent. Perhaps you'll be one of those. <laughs> well, I would... I would be greatly honored if you did so that'd be right great. on <laughs> so thank you so much for being on the show this has been a great conversation my pleasure thanks for doing it and for having me i'd like to thank sharon for joining us on this week in heresy you can subscribe to this week in heresy via tune in itunes stitcher or the app of your choice you can also financially support this podcast through patreon.com thank you very much for listening and if you have any questions or comments Feel free to leave me a message through Twitter at TWIH Podcast or on thisweekinheresy.com.